Wait, where are the enemies? This is so weird, I... Hold on. Outlast... Two... Patch... Note. Are you serious? They removed some of the chase scenes? How am I supposed to film my cold open now? What am I supposed to do? I wonder where my wife is. Wait, is that a note? Few horror games in recent memory have been as divisive as Outlast 2. The hype for the game was impalpable considering its predecessor was such a surprise hit. Not only for its incredibly well done horror elements, but its subversions on the genre, including a complete lack of combative measures and the use of a night vision camera to see through the darkness. So when the demo was released, the hype compounded, as players were introduced to a completely new setting in a rogues gallery of hostels, plus a perplexing dual narrative that seemed to suggest an infusion of the paranormal. And with the release being delayed from October 2016 to April 2017, fans were positively exploding with anticipation. The game was by no means a critical or commercial flop. It still received praise from the same reviewers and fans, but that praise seemed to come with a lot more caveats this time around. Most of the criticism was centered on a confusing story, frustrating gameplay, and gore so excessive that it alternated between gratuitous and mind-numbing. The cast of characters didn't seem to resonate as well with players either. Marta was no Chris Walker, Nick and Laird were no Dr. Traeger, and despite Val's best efforts, she couldn't win our love like our darling Eddie Gluskin. Darling. However, what the game does well, it does phenomenally. The graphics are gorgeous, the scares are heart-stopping, and the narrative, once pieced together, is both tragic and beautiful in how deep the corruption of it all runs. Overall, it is a brutal, enthralling experience, bursting with creativity and depravity. Media of this scale often undergoes a lot of twists and changes before its release, which brings us to the topic of this video, Outlast 2 Cut Content. With a game so convoluted, it's no surprise that certain lines, story beats, and gameplay mechanics were conceived, developed, and ultimately scrapped. But over the years, it became apparent just how much was thrown away from Outlast 2. So much it merits its own video discussing what could have been. For the record, we're not going to talk about the patch released in 2018 to rectify perceived difficulty issues, nor any secrets or theories about the game. What I'm interested in is the stuff that was left behind. Firstly, let's address a popular talking point about its pre-development, that the game had to modify a rape scene in compliance with Australian censors. This was referring to the sequence where a drugged Blake Langerman is set upon by Val in the mines. This got some fans to complain that thanks to Australia, Outlast 2 was going to be censored worldwide. According to a statement by Red Barrels, however, a wrong version of the scene was accidentally attached to the game sent to the Australian Classification Board for review. The ACB's description of said scene is indeed much more graphic than the one we got, with a not-so-implicit reference to Val giving Blake oral sex. You have to get his penis erect, so what you're gonna do is just suck his dick. That's like you said you were gonna do. Where was I? Australia. Yes, Australia! While something more explicit might have been intended at one point, it appears that Red Barrels made the decision independently to tone down the scene, without input from Australian censors. It may be true that they decided to modify this scene, but let's not go around thinking it was because of Australia. That doesn't mean nothing else about this sequence was toned down. The chase theme for Val and the Heretics is distinctive and propulsive, but the in-game version is actually a stripped version of the original piece, featured on the official soundtrack album entitled Show Me Your True Face. Composer Samuel Laflamme is quoted saying, at one point, I think I went too far, and Phil from Red Barrels felt it would be too intense to put in the ears of gamers during 30 minutes of gameplay. There are distorted sounds that I can't play too often in it. It's too intense. I had to tone it down a bit, and in the album, it was possible to put them at the right place. But in-game, within an interactive world, you don't have this precise control. <laughs> On 
On its own, the track is much more panic-inducing, but from a practical standpoint, I can understand why it was altered. It's interesting to see how even elements of the music had to be toned down for content. Even as early as the demo, one suggested concept was a sequence where Blake loses his glasses. This, hypothetically, would have led to a sequence in-game where Blake has to recover them, and the player's vision would be blurry while they attempted to navigate the environment and dodge enemies. Sure enough, in-game there are a few sequences where Blake indeed loses his glasses and his vision goes blurry, only to immediately put them back on. This idea is never fully explored in-game, and that is a bit of a disappointment. If pulled off correctly, it could have been one of the game's scariest moments. The player wandering around blindly, not knowing if the thing in front of them is an enemy. It's likely the developers simply couldn't make the sequence work as expected and scrapped it, while neglecting to remove the previous lose glasses animations. Regardless, fans and players definitely noticed. One handicap that was definitely conceived and then scrapped was Blake's asthma inhaler. Thanks to Redditor's stressed out musician, we have a model and animation of the player administering an inhaler, presumably after an extended period of running. This is corroborated by voice lines that seemingly allege to the player having asthma. Oh, fuck! Uh, too tight! I just gotta... breathe! Can't breathe! Most likely this concept proved too much of a hindrance to include, especially considering the player's limited stamina and need for bandages. Or maybe they just thought Blake was lame enough already. This is my inhaler! Speaking of Blake, exploring the game's audio files further reveals a plethora of voice lines that didn't make the cut. This isn't unusual for video games, but considering that Blake as a protagonist is hit or miss with fans, the inclusion of some of these lines might have added some layers to his character, accentuating his deadpan sense of humor and descent into madness. Here are some of my uh, personal favorites that, as far as I know, weren't in the main game. Well, this is gonna be a ridiculous way to die. Absolutely fucking no! He couldn't get to her. You already failed her. You've always failed. A raft. Well, that seems seaworthy. Kind of. <laughs> Fuck! Fucking hillbilly backwoods amateur bullshit! Sweet bleeding Christ, what is that? Smile, motherfuckers. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. There's a father up above, and he's looking down in love. So be careful, little eyes, what you see. Lift me up. I'm going to heaven. <laughs> well, I would fucking kill myself. I would have really loved for these lines to find a home in Outlast 2. To give Blake something more to talk about. You know, something more than just nuking Temple Gate with F-bombs. Oh, oh, fuck me! What happened in the crash? Fuck this. We now turn to the game's main antagonist, Sullivan Noth, whom you only see a grand total of... twice. <laughs> of note is some of his concept art taken from the Nintendo Switch Outlast bundle by Redditor, uh... Luvisia? Luvisia? Okay. They're pretty conventional in terms of concept art, with the exception of the fourth one. I mean, look at him. <laughs> he looks like a dad. <laughs> like, Papa Nas gonna crack open a cold one and watch a game of football. <laughs> like other aspects in the game, it's implied that Noth had a larger role before his presence was ultimately reduced. One of his more defining traits is the relationship with his enforcer, Marta, whom he had known since childhood and manipulated into killing for God at Temple Gate. Two notes we find around her property tell us this, but again, unused voice lines suggest they were going to share a scene together where he relays this affirmation. There, there, dear, my vicious little angel. You won't have to be strong much longer. A little more blood, and we're done, Marta. God loves you. I love you. Be strong. Since the letters detail this relationship already, it's understandable why they scrap this, to avoid sounding redundant. An earlier letter implies Noth has syphilis, and he's receiving penicillin from the outside world under the guise of study aids. This is a great kink in his character and clever foreshadowing of the wretched horror to come later on. Further emphasized by this unused line, which was apparently supposed to be played accidentally through the loudspeakers. Get you a fucking minister cabinet! 
If even one fucking pill is spilled, I swear to fucking- Stay classy, poppin' off. More scrapped content comes with Laird Byron and Nick Tremblay, the two assholes who preside as both Tyrant and Warden for the afflicted members of Temple Gate in an isolated sick camp. They, alongside the rest of the Scald, are convinced by Noth that their diseases are spiritual in nature, and their gospel predicts that a messiah will arrive to cleanse their sores and deliver them salvation. <laughs> Blake, naturally, doesn't seem to want to go along with it. Near the end of this revolting section, Nick and Laird are betrayed by their oppressed subjects and push off a building, where they crash into the dock below and perish from the impact. In the full game, they just die and nothing happens, while Blake pulls out his camera to film them like the sick fuck he is. My dad died within a month of my mom. He was perfectly healthy until she was- No one cares! But Laird's voice lines suggest a more tender moment between him and Nick had been planned, yet again, ultimately scrapped. Get off me! Get off me, Nick! I can't breathe! Nick! Get off! Nick! I'm sorry! I'm so sorry! It's good news, Nick! We're not sick no more! He made it so we ain't gonna be sick again. <laughs> now this is something I truly wish had been in the game. Despite their assholery, Nick, Laird, and the Scald had been deceived, driven to the brink by their own devotion, their sicknesses, and Murkoff's experimental microwaves. Sure, they tried to kill us, but they truly believed that it would absolve them from their afflictions, which they were told was brought upon by their own spiritual shortcomings. That moment of mercy and self-forgiveness before their death gives these characters a resolution, a well-rounded catharsis to all the suffering they'd endured in Temple Gate. Now, after so much depressing talk, let's talk about love. Specifically, the love one gives to a child. Real talk though, if you have headphones, uh, plug them in. What's coming up is not something you want playing out loud. Outlast 2's big selling point is its school scenes a hallucination-induced parallel narrative told in reverse. The setting and atmosphere change is incredibly jarring, yet extremely effective. St. Sibyl's is filled with trippy rooms that defy logic, bloodstained religious imagery, and its two ghostly entities. Visions of Jessica, a fourth-grade girl who went to school with young Blake, and... <laughs> this fucking thing. A handsy, tonguey, schlongy demon representing a monstrous version of the school's music teacher and priest, Father Loudermilch. What's that? A priest? Plus a little girl? In a horror game? That's bad news bears. There exists this cool concept art of the demon, featuring something that kind of resembles a Samka from Resident Evil Village, but I do prefer the final version we got. The game reveals that Loudermilch was systemically molesting Jessica and that his actions led to her death, which he subsequently framed as a suicide and shamed Blake into going along with. In game, the priest's voice haunts Blake from both the real world and the hallucinated world mostly manipulative taunts to force Blake into silence. Although more salacious lines exist in the staticky video recordings when played in reverse, some of the most explicit content didn't make it into the game at all. She likes it, Blake. You wanted to touch her too. Young skin. Smooth. Soft. Like the lobe of your ear. Gross. That's bad enough already, but as if there were any doubt at all, there exists a total of nine voice lines between Jessica and Loudermilch of a rape sequence. Yeah. Skip here if you don't want to hear them as they're extremely uncomfortable to listen to. I've decided to play a small section of one line from each character as they're not incredibly distinct from one another. And really, who wants to sit through nine to 15 seconds of this? By the way, if you answered yes, I'm throwing you in the pregnant lady suicide pit. You got those headphones plugged in? Yeah, sure. Okay. Isaiah, I see you. Most likely, these sounds would play as Laudermilch closes the door on Blake, if the player chooses to stick around instead of immediately running for the exit. Frankly, I'm glad the developers opted to cut this out. 
The implications of sexual abuse between Loudermilch and Jessica were pretty brazen already, and I'm sure including the sounds in the game would have put anyone who bought a copy on some kind of watch list. Sometimes it's best to just leave things up to imagination. The most significant scrapped content comes from the game's climax, where Blake descends into the mines. Firstly, one thing that's never really addressed is the earthquake that's going on as Blake barrels through the underground tunnels. Walls rumble and rocks crumble, and another unused Sullivan Noth voice line suggests that everyone in Temple Gate was feeling it as well. Ah. Uh, <laughs> children! Children! Ch children, stay calm! Nothing shakes the earth but the will of the Lord! And God's on our side. We got nothing to fear. Us doing his work. The Lord's wrath is kept for blasphemers, for the enemy, for the disseminator of his foul seed. Pray and hold fast. God loves you. In another instance, these images courtesy of Redditor Okian Pises Pises? Courtesy of this Redditor show a crank and a generator, plus a video of what appears to be pistons located in the mines that the player apparently had to stop to crawl underneath. This was most likely cut because it was too similar to previous sequences in the town square and with the water wheel. Although it does give some context to the seemingly throwaway line from Blake when live wires block his path. Jesus, those wires are alive. How the fuck are they getting power from? As discovered by YouTuber Mercy, Blake and Lynn's escape from the mines was supposed to be different as well. Glitching past a pile of rubble reveals yet another generator, this time labeled Elevator Power Generator, which presumably would have been used by the Langermans to arrive at the surface. The real focus of the mines, however, concerns one character in particular. Val is probably Outlast 2's most intriguing villain. There's so much to be said about her character, yet her presence in the story seems diminished, and she's given an unsatisfying conclusion. In the game, it's implied that she was killed along with the rest of the heretics at the hands of the villagers. Yet it didn't take much to figure out by comparing unused voice lines that a much different fate was intended for Val. But now, we have the models in animation. Here's the sequence in its entirety. Now, using voice lines from both Val and Marta, I've attempted to recreate the scene with appropriate dialogue and music. Straight, pale fruit, you're going to love me. I have so much pleasure to share with you. What? Be We know that Val was once a Temple Gate top confidant before she defected and brought together the heretics. So this final exchange with Marta is her literally getting the last laugh, taunting her with the notion that she was Nos' favorite, as opposed to Marta. Ultimately, this sequence gives Val a more satisfying end at Marta's expense, and it's likely the developers felt they wanted to prioritize Marta's story over Val, granting the players one final encounter with the enemy they encountered first. Say what you want about the impact of that encounter, but that's what we got in the end. Outlast 2's scrap content seems indicative of the game as a whole, amid critiques of the game butting off more than it could chew, or being too shocking or convoluted for its own good. What we've seen in this video is an even greater testament to the fact. With one or two exceptions, we can only really speculate on whether all this scrap content was left behind for budgetary, time-sensitive, or creative reasons. But regardless of what could have worked and what couldn't have worked, it's still fascinating to uncover and think about the game, or games, we could have gotten what Outlast 2 could have been.
Hey there. If you made it to the end, um, thank you. I truly appreciate it. Um, this was my first attempt at making one of these video essays, and um, I'm still learning. I'm still trying to figure out how to, you know, be comfortable with the setup, uh, speak into a microphone, um, get the audio parameters right, all that stuff. Um, if all goes well, I plan on making more content like this in the future, um, focusing around, like, horror literature and media and other stuff like that. Not necessarily Outlast, but if that stuff interests you, then hit that subscribe button. I'd also like to extend my gratitude to all the creators and contributors who provided content for me to use in this video. I mean, this project would not have been possible without them, so thank you. Thank you all so much. And now for some shameless plugs. Did you know I'm also a horror author? My first novel, Hell's Gulf, drops August 6th and is available for pre-order now, so check out the links below and take a look. And for you Outlast fans out there, my first self-published novel, Simeon, took a lot of inspiration from the, uh, like the mood and the tone and some of the plot points from the Outlast series, so that will definitely be enjoyable for you if you also enjoy Outlast. Once again, thank you for watching. I hope to see you all soon.